Okay, so thank you for the invitation to speak here today. And what I really wanted to do this morning was to give you an overview of the non-visual effects of light and how some of these might be taken into account when we're thinking about building design. So when we think about our um, light environment, probably one of the first things that we think about is sunlight or daylight, or often in the UK it's the lack of sunlight and daylight that we have to put up with. And this can be whether or not we're at home or at work or in other environments such as at school or in hospitals or commuting between these um, different areas. But obviously, as you know, we are now a 24-7 society, so not only do we have to consider our daytime light exposure, but we now have to think about the light that we're exposed to at night. So you saw earlier on the image um, in the centre of the screen here. This is looking at Europe by night, and you can see how well lit up we are. And this is not only because we tend to socialise late into the evening, but we now often work overnight, and also we need to think about our light environment in our own home. So obviously we all know that light is very important for vision, but what is less well appreciated is the fact that light can have a profound impact on our behaviour and our physiology. So we know that from the eye we have a direct projection um, to the, um, from, as I say, from the back of our eye, our retina, to a variety of different areas in the brain. And this very dedicated tract provides information about the overall level of environmental light. And this information is transmitted to the brain, and then we have a variety of different responses. So in the short term, light can affect both our physiology and our behavior. So it's known that light can directly boost our alertness. It can also influence our performance, and this is both cognitive performance and also physical performance. And light also can affect our mood. Now, light also has a number of physiological effects. So on the right-hand side of your screen, I've shown two graphs here, where you can see our core body temperature rhythm and our heart rate. And both of these parameters actually drop at night, so they're at their minimum overnight. And if we're exposed to light, in this case, um, you can see the blue lines where people were exposed to blue light, you can see that light's actually capable of sustaining our core body temperature, keeping it elevated, and also the same for heart rate. One of the other effects that light can have is, if you shine a light in your eye, you obviously will see the pupil constrict. And finally, one of the other acute effects that light can have is it can actually directly influence levels of different hormones. Um, and one of the best well-characterized responses is the ability of light to suppress the level of the hormone melatonin, which many of you may have heard about. It's a hormone that's produced overnight, and its production is associated with the body preparing for sleep. Um, in the long term, however, one of the most important effects of light is its ability to synchronize our circadian clock, so the clock in our brain that drives 24-hour rhythms in physiology and behavior. And it's really important that this clock is synchronized to local time, so the local light-dark cycle. Now, we know that light has different effects depending on the time of day that you administer it. So if you give light in the early part of the night, it actually will push your body clock later in time, which is what we call a phase delay. And this is what you would want if you were flying westward. So if you're flying to the States, for example, and you want to adapt your body clock, this is the time of day that you'd need to be receiving light. By contrast, if you give light in the very late night, early time in the morning, it actually pushes your clock in the opposite direction. It shifts it earlier in time, which is what you would want if you were flying eastward. So for example, if we were flying here to Asia. And there are certain situations where the body clock is not appropriately synchronized to um, local time. And examples of these include night shift work and also jet lag. And I'll come on to in a minute why these are so important and need to be considered for health. Just as a brief aside, I just wanted to explain um, how our sleep patterns are determined. So there are two processes within our brain that um, interact together to determine the timing, duration, and quality of our sleep. We have the circadian clock that I've mentioned already, situated in the hypothalamus of our brain and drives these 24-hour rhythms. And we also have a sleep homeostat. This essentially acts as an egg timer, so sleepiness will build up during the day as the longer that we're awake, the more sleepiness we have. And then when we fall asleep at night, the sleepiness will dissipate, and then the whole process starts again when we wake the next day. So why is light so important when we're thinking about health and well-being? So I've already briefly mentioned to you circadian misalignment, those situations when the clock is inappropriately aligned with the local time. And <laughs> Sorry, circadian misalignment can cause disruption to sleep. However, also as a society, we are chronically sleep-deprived. So what's the impact of having a misaligned clock and having very short sleep? 
Well, in the short term, it's probably fairly obvious. Um, we feel very fatigued. We have um, very reduced levels of performance. And also, this will have an impact on our safety. Probably one of the very well-known quoted examples is the fact that the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl happened at three in the morning when night shift workers were at their lowest level of alertness, and this obviously had severe safety consequences. In the long term, both circadian misalignment and short sleep have been linked to a number of different diseases, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, immune disorders, and the metabolic syndrome. And it's also been demonstrated that repeatedly disrupting your clock can have an impact on your long-term cognitive function. So we really need to consider our light environment both at work and at home to make sure that we have a well-synchronized clock, to make sure that we're having good quality and a good duration of sleep, and to make sure that we're fully alert during waking hours. So what type of light is best? So obviously, I'm sure you're all aware, in our eye, we have um, our three-cone system, which is responsible for our color vision. And we also have our rods, which help us be able to see under dim light. But about 15 years ago, it was discovered that in our eye, there is a third photoreceptor called melanopsin. And this is most sensitive to blue light, around 480 nanometers. And it is this photopigment that provides this primary information for these non-visual effects that I've been talking about. So when it was first discovered that melanopsin was there and it was driving these non-visual effects, there was a sort of flurry of development of blue light products on the market. But over the last few years, through some of the research that we've been doing, it's been established that actually these visual photopigments can also contribute to these non-visual effects on physiology and behavior. And so there's been sort of more of a move back to actually trying to look at how can we optimize polychromatic white light. So not only are we stimulating all the photopigments for both non-visual effects, but also visual effects. And so what we're seeing a lot more of now is that these um, blue enhanced um, lights coming onto the market, so actually mimicking daylight. And you can see an example of this on the left. So when we're thinking about house design or our building design, what do we need to be doing? So from everything I've said so far, you can see that what we really need to be doing is appropriately modifying the light-dark cycle. We need to think about the type of light we're getting and the quality, but also the time of day that we're receiving the light. So some times of day we really want to have a lot of daylight and we want to maximize our light. Other times we really want to be trying to minimize the light that's there. And as I said, this, the main targets are obviously to synchronize the clock and promote good sleep. So if we want to enhance our exposure to outdoor light, obviously we can look at the number and the size of the windows and the orientation. As I said, there are certain times of day when we really want to maximize this and other times when we want to try and utilize um, shades or blinds or different filters to cut out certain wavelengths of light. Obviously, we can supplement daylight with different artificial light. Again, we'd need to look at the spectral quality and brightness. And there's obviously been a move away from very warm tungsten lighting into much more energy efficient bulbs and even increasing use of LEDs, which are very blue enriched and so can have a very positive effect. There's also the option of having dynamic lighting, where both the intensity and the wavelength of light can be modulated over the day, depending on the effect that you want to have. So just to conclude my talk, I wanted to go through light at different times of day and potentially how we can modify this. So when we think about light in the morning, so for the majority of us, our circadian clock actually runs at slightly longer than 24 hours, and it requires a daily correction to keep it synchronized to the 24-hour day and it's morning light that's critical for providing that signal. The other reason that light's very important in the morning is to boost our mood and alertness. We're all ex used to experiencing what we call sleep inertia, which is that grogginess you feel when you first wake up. And so how can we use light to minimize that? It's also worth mentioning that when we first wake up in the morning, our eyes are going to be more sensitive to light. We've obviously spent all night asleep with our eyes shut in the darkness. And so very, when we first wake up, light at a lower level is probably more likely to have an effect than it would later in the day. So in terms of tools to try and um, optimize this, we can obviously use artificial light, both bright and blue and rich light. Also, we can use devices such as dawn simulators where the light gradually comes on during the last part of sleep. And this has been shown to help both synchronize the clock and disperse sleep inertia. But in a similar way, could we not try and use natural morning light to mimic this? So having east-facing bedrooms, having blackout blinds with timers that start to come on as we want to start to wake up. And then considering the rooms that people would move into next when they come out of their bedrooms, so kitchen, breakfast room, trying to maximize their light exposure. During the day, obviously, we also want to think about our light um, environment. And one particular group that this is quite relevant to are older people. Um, 
we've done some studies where we've looked at older people in care homes and they do tend to be in very, very low level light environments. They have limited mobility. They often suffer from daytime somnolence. So how could we try and help them during the day? So perhaps, for example, we, A, we could supplement with artificial light, but making sure that we have easily accessible gardens or terraces to try and, as I say, boost their light exposure and help with the sleep problems that a lot of elder people suffer. Again, we need to think about office lighting. The, um, studies have been done where within an office they've used different types of lighting on different floors and they've looked at productivity and performance and they see a real difference depending on the lighting that's used. And then finally, I just wanted to consider light in the evening. Now, from our point of view, obviously what we want to try and promote is an optimal night of sleep and we need to consider light, noise and temperature. But in the few hours before bedtime, it's really important that we're in an environment that's a non-alerting light stimulus. We want to try and help the body prepare for sleep. So the rooms that people are in during this time should ideally be dimly lit and using those longer wavelengths, so more green, red lights, and trying to take away that blue environment. And obviously, there are a lot of um, devices now that have these evening screen settings where you can see here they're much more red lit to try and take away that alerting blue light stimulus. And a population that's particularly important to target here are teenagers. So I'm sure you all know teenagers like to go to bed late and get up even later. And this is a biological phenomenon. They can't help it. The body does change as we go through adolescence with regards to sleep and the circadian clock. But teenagers don't help themselves. They will tend to sit in bedrooms at night with their iPads or their phones. And so we need to look at ways to try and get them to minimize the use of these bright light devices. So in terms of light in the evening, tools that we can use. We need to make the bedroom as conducive to sleep as possible. So I said before, minimizing light, minimizing noise, but also trying to optimize the temperature. So around 18 degrees is about the optimal temperature for sleep. Um, so we also need to make sure that we minimize the impact of any daylight or street lighting outside. And the other thing that we need to consider is obviously people may get up in the night to go to the bathroom. It doesn't take long for light to have a very alerting effect and make it very difficult for you to go back to sleep. So again, we need to think about bathrooms having low intensity light and again, these longer wavelengths. So just to summarize, um, I do believe that the biological effects of light can be exploited to optimize health and well-being. We need to think about synchronizing the circadian clock, ensuring sleep of good quality and duration, and being able to promote a wake period with a high level of alertness, mood and performance. And I think that we can consider all these factors in building design and use both natural environmental and artificial light together and also ways of minimizing light as required. Thank you.